Okay, the second section of our discussion is devoted to visual narratives on immigration in photos. And our first photographer, uh, celebrated and fascinating photographer, is Wing Yang Hui. And like uh, Ursula is an alumnus of the University of Minnesota, where he earned his BA in journalism in 1979. <coughs> his work is, is at the intersection between journalism and photography. But he's also an educator and director of the first place gallery. So you can say <laughs> He's interested in a diverse migration, immigration histories of Minnesotans, ranging from Lutheran to Latin to Chinese. He typically interviews Minnesotans or facilitates discussions between them and then takes pictures of them or makes them photograph each other and brings the resulting words and images into the public space. I'm describing this in very broad strokes, since it is really Wing himself who best describes in which way he does visual narratives on migration. Uh, so what am I is a, a question that um, was a bit confusing to me when I was growing up. I'm the youngest of six, and I'm the only one in my family that wasn't born in China. I was born in Duluth. I'm a native Minnesotan. Uh, we were the only Asian family in our neighborhood, and this is my first grade class picture. You see me? All right, there. So I'm um, the only Asian kid, not just in the uh, my first grade, I'm the only Asian kid in the entire elementary school. I'm the only Asian kid in school till high school. In high school, this other Asian dude shows up, and when I saw him, I avoided him. <laughs> so I uh, got my degree from uh, uh, U of M here in journalism. I was trained to be a reporter, and I bought my first camera in between my sophomore and junior year, and I decided I wanted to become a photographer. But uh, I felt that I'm, I was committed to the journalism program, so I thought I'd get my BA and then teach myself photography. My first uh, subject was my mom. This is before they called it a selfie. You put a camera on a tripod. This is my mom in the living room, a uh, house I grew up in Duluth. TV was always on, but mom never watched TV because mom never learned to speak English. She came over as an adult. She raised me and my older brothers and sister, and she never had the wherewithal. I don't think I even desire to learn English. Um, my mom had a lot of influence over me, uh, whatever. I mean, she was my mom. But whatever influence she had, um, had to compete with what came out of that box. And I watched TV constantly. And there was very little that came out of that box that reflected the realities of my family. But it was so overwhelming. I became what I saw. To the point that uh, there were times when my mom seemed exotic and foreign to me. So then um, I started my photographic career and trying to understand just who are we. And uh, I did a lot of projects, but I'm just going to show you two. Uh, I did a project on Lake Street where I photographed uh, six miles of Lake Street. Uh, the neighborhood's connected, and we just walk up and down the street and introduce myself. And uh, everyone that I photographed was a stranger. So these are all photographs in South Minneapolis. And my first projects were in black and white. I felt that color could get in the way of how we see each other. I thought that black and white was more artful. And then 10 years later, I did another six mile project along University Avenue from the Mississippi, uh, from the Minneapolis border to the state capitol. And again, spent four years photographing thousands of people uh, in color and in black and white. And same thing, just walk up and down the street, or I photographed in schools, um, photographed in um, stores restaurants, places of worship. Playground, mosque. You never know when you see an angel walking down the street. I've had my photographs exhibited in um, museums and galleries, but what I'm best known for is exhibiting my photographs in the neighborhoods where I took the photographs. Uh, my first project, or the uh, first project you saw there was on Lake Street. And so uh, four years photographing, and then in the year 2000, uh, with volunteers, we approached uh, 300 businesses along six miles of Lake Street, asking if we, we could put photographs 
in their windows, uh, store windows. Half the businesses said no. All the businesses in Uptown said no. In fact, they got a little annoyed. We are not Lake Street. We are Uptown. <clears throat> and in uh, June of 2000, uh, with volunteers, we, we um, displayed uh, 675 photographs along six miles of Lake Street and turned it into a six-mile gallery. Um, there, was always, there was so much uh, media publicity that by the end of the month, uptown businesses were calling me, <laughs> wanting photographs in their windows, and we obliged. We wanted to be inclusive. We put them on bus stops. The one on the left is mine. <laughs> How often can you walk down the street and see a photograph of you? Instead of an advertisement trying to sell you a product, an idea, a way of life. In my projects, I've given people chalkboards. After photographing for so many years, I started to think that no matter how good the photograph is, it's still just a surface description. How can you create an image, a photograph, that goes below the surface? I thought, I'll give people chalkboards. And came up with open-ended questions. What challenges have you faced? I saw this um, mother and her child at a bus stop, approached them, complete stranger, um, 10 minutes before a bus came, this is what she wrote. Sometimes I would ask strangers. These two people didn't know each other. I asked if I could um, ask them a question. Um, what challenges have you faced? Um, and this is what they wrote. They were both, they were complete strangers. Uh, I hope prejudices, prejudices that need to be faced and overcome. Sometimes I would ask the question, what do you hope for? <laughs> yes, what do you hope for? What advice would you give to a stranger? So after using this uh, method, uh, this process uh, with strangers, um, I decided to use this with students. I give a lot of presentations to all different uh, schools. And I have students pair up with another student they don't normally talk to. And when I tell them I'm going to do this, no one wants to do it because they think it's going to be awkward. They're worried about what the other student will think of them. They're worried about um, there's going to be a lot of silence. They're worried about um, that they'll say something wrong. And so uh, once we pair them up, um, I give them questions in which to have a conversation. And then they write something on the chalkboard. It could be answered to one of the questions, but it really, you could write anything you wanted on the chalkboard as long as it reveals something about you. The conversation was just a way for you to get to know someone and for that person to get to know you and to think about um, what you want to reveal about yourself. These were sixth graders. This is actually what was a college. It was a high school. This was um, just last week, sixth grade. Also sixth grade. Mohammed, as you said, we live in our bubbles. We need to expand outside of our bubbles. And you can't quite read that, but this is an R. You will rise. Sixth grader. So then, um, growing up, not knowing what I was, um, I wanted to be like everyone else. Um, when I saw this other Asian kid, I was really seeing myself for the first time. You don't grow up with a mirror in front of you. The people around you are your mirror. And so when I saw this other Asian kid, I thought, he looks different. Therefore, I must look different. And I didn't want to think about that for a long time. Um, 
this is a book that we published um, in several weeks. And uh, with this, I went to China for the first time uh, eight years ago. And going to China, I started to think, what if? What if my um, family had never left China? What if I had grown up in China? Um, what if I was not the youngest of six and uh, I had to work 60 hours a week like my brothers in my father's restaurant instead of being afforded the, the luxury to become an artist? What if I turned out the way my mom really wanted me to turn out? Uh, married to a Chinese woman with Chinese kids. That didn't happen. So I decided to photograph Chinese men whose lives I could have had and then ask to wear their clothes and then give them the camera. Here I'm wearing the clothes of my cousin's husband in the village where my family is from. My first time going to the village, uh, my father, my mother would tell me stories when I was growing up in, in Duluth and they weren't real to me, they were just stories. And going there and wearing uh, my cousin's husband's clothes, who they're farmers, and my family sent money back to them for years, because they're poor. Gave me a little more understanding of, of my family. So how does my identity shift? Uh, when I show this in schools, I ask students, which one do you think is the most me? Which one do you think they choose? <laughs> they choose this one. <laughs> So I grew up playing basketball, uh, um, played basketball my whole life, but I was always the only Asian kid on the court when I was growing up in Duluth. I, I always wondered what it would have been like if I had grown up playing with other Asians. And so um, I'm wearing the jersey of a, of a guy who grew up in Chinatown in Philadelphia. And his father owned a restaurant just like my father, and he worked for his dad. And uh, once you did your work, you can do anything you wanted because your parents don't have time to look after you. So you play basketball. And so he grew up playing with other Asians, and he's got a team called the Philadelphia Suns, and he's a, he's a coach now for uh, Chinese teams in Chinatown. And then I went to China and, and wore the clothes of, of my, my cousin's husband. And ended with this photograph. Um, I photograph, um, so she met him when they were in their 20s. This was before they had met. She was a waitress uh, at a Chinese restaurant in Minneapolis. He was a cook. Someone sent them on a, a, on a blind date. And they got married. And they had a daughter. But what he didn't tell his wife or his daughter was that his name that he told them was not his real name. How many people here have heard of the term paper sons and paper daughters? So Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, 1882, uh, first time the United States government decided to target another country and say, you, your people cannot come here. They targeted China. But people came anyhow. There was a historic fire in San Francisco, 1906. Uh, a lot of people came to this country, uh, came to immigration in San Francisco. And so thousands of papers were burned. And then you, if, you, if your paper was burned, you would tell immigration, hey, my wife in China had another son. Immigration uh, issues you another paper for your son, and you sell that paper. So thousands of people sold their papers for Chinese posing as their son and daughter. That's how they came to this country. He was a paper son. He came to the United States when he was 12 years old um, and had to, he was interrogated by immigration and to prove that he was who he said he was. So he had to memorize the village he's supposed to be from, where the house was located, how many in his family, and so on. And he he passed, and he lived a life of secrecy. And they found out about it a year before he died, who he really was, that he was actually in the military. He served in a flying tiger's squadron, famous. He never told them. He lived a life of secrecy. Um, <clears throat> so he has, uh, they have something in common with me, because my father um, was a paper son. I didn't know this growing up. I had a different name growing up. Wing G, G E E was my last name. I didn't know this was not our real name. No, the third grade, my father comes in my bedroom and says, we're moving to New York. I have no idea. I'm not even sure when I even understood why. Um, 1965 Naturalization Act, if you were here illegally and you came forward and confessed you were illegal, um, immigration might allow you to stay in this country. And so he was entering this program and we moved to New York um, to hide out and then plus he knew Chinese people there and he wanted to know if this was a trap. And so it wasn't a trap. 
uh, we were allowed to stay in the country and uh, we were given, given amnesty. Uh, eighth grade, my name was changed back to Huey. So of course, history is, is coming around again. So um, thank you. Xavier Xavier de Castro is an internationally recognized photographer who earned a degree at the University of Minnesota as well, and in this case not in journalism, but in the field of photography and moving image. He just returned here this fall to teach at the art department, but also to do portraits of the departments in our college, and you can see them next door. However, the main reason why he's here is, and now I'm using your own words, um, that he learned after moving from Mexico City to the United States what it felt like to be part of a subculture, the immigrant community, subjected to alienation, subjecting to alienation has transformed the focus of his photographs to share the lives of those who are marginalized. Images have offered insight into the diversity of numerous communities and given a voice to those who are often invisible. End of talk. Good evening. Um, every time that I think that one of my projects is not longer relevant, um, there's people who assure me that they are extremely relevant. Um, yesterday evening, uh, on my way back from work, I was uh, hearing uh, Trump in Rochester, and he was saying the exact same words uh, that he did during his campaign. After close to two years, uh, his rhetoric is exactly the same. And the way that he infuses this fear and uh, racism towards uh, Mexicans is, is exactly the same. So I'm going to show you a project that I started about close to two years. I was about to finish my master's here and for my thesis I wanted I was doing films 60 millimeter films and um, I was being very critical of the Latino community in the United States uh, that same November came and uh, I changed my whole thesis in the last, in the last semester um, realizing that Latinos um, Latinos, Hispanics, Chicanos, Mexicans, uh, we are marked by the border. Uh, even, I mean, how, however we have come here, by food, by plane, by train, by boat, uh, or if we, uh, some of us have been born here, we are deeply marked by the notion of the border, even if uh, we haven't ever been in the actual borderlands. So I thought, I, 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 wanna, I wanna go there, and I want to make a trip that starts in one coast and ends in another one. By now I have done three trips, I have uh, I have uh, gone through by car from coast to coast crossing <coughs> uh, every time that I can to to Mexico um, it has been very very interesting and I'm going to show you a couple of my projects that had to do with identity and uh, border um, one of them that I included in my thesis was um, was this one. I'm always thinking about north and south and that, that dichotomy and the amount of 
the amount of information that we have put and symbolism that we have put in certain uh, in certain objects and animals and, and whatnot, being the bald eagle, uh, you know, inherited of uh, of uh, uh, U.S. culture, and the golden eagle of Mexican culture. The golden eagle is the one that is in the flag in the, in the Mexican flag, and finding out that if I put them. Uh, in the wall, one besides the other, they become a symbol. But if I display them horizontally, they become a specimen, and they uh, they get rid of all the symbolism that they carry, of that we have put in them. I started also to build characters. I'm not, I don't only do documentary work in photography. I also, every now and then, like to construct images uh, to tell a story or to uh, tell a point. And I started to uh, recruit Latinos to help me out and photograph them <coughs> in this fashion. Uh, menacing and vulnerable at the same time. Menacing because they have either a bat or a a piece of wood in their hand and vulnerable because they're blindfolded. I am grabbing from uh, two different sources of imagery. I am grabbing from the icon of justice. If you remember, the icon of justice is blindfolded. It has a balance in one hand and it has a sword on the other one. In this case, they're blindfolded and they have a stick or a bat. The only place, the only situation that you're going to see people like this is if they are going to, about to participate in the breaking of a piñata. So I'm grabbing from Mexican culture and I'm grabbing also for that, from that sense of, of justice. So I started my, my trip in the border in Tijuana and I planned I'm, I'm a portrait photographer for the most part, and I plan to photograph the landscape, something that is completely foreign to me, something that is I'm not used to. <coughs> but inevitably, uh, I will run into people and try to interview them, talk to them, and uh, with that same sense and need to photograph the landscape, I'm photographing some people too. Um, I look at this as a topography of their own life. There's a, uh, he has tattooed on himself his family history. This is one of the first photos that I took in Tijuana, uh, San Diego. Actually, this is taken in San Diego. This is taken in the other side, in Tijuana. The wall goes into the ocean. I'm always interested in the north and south the up and down, what seems to be up is not up, what seems to be down is not down. Also in Tijuana, uh, and, and talking about access, in some places I can access, uh, you know, without a problem, uh, but in others not so much. I, I wanted to photograph the prototypes of the wall, and it was impossible to me to approach on the, on the U.S. side. I really tried. And I went around a uh, big radius of, um, of uh, surrounding the area, and I couldn't get in. And uh, talking to uh, the Border Patrol, they, they, they will tell me, you, uh, I mean, even if you go through the bare terrain, I'm not sure if they're going to allow you to get close. I knew that I can access the prototypes from the Mexican side. And they're right there. Actually, I climbed climb on the derby, uh, uh, the, the debris and was able to look at uh, um, the area. It was actually covered by um, four or five semis that are, were blocking part of the view because Trump was going to visit that in the next couple of days. In two days, two days after he, I miss him by, by a couple of days. Um, 
This is also in San Diego. You can see three uh, Border Patrol there. And uh, that's where I started to, to photograph the landscape and also looking for surveillance and looking for other things. This other one is in, in Tijuana. And I like this very much. It's a very simple portrait of a guy that is selling uh, these uh, inflated balloons. And I thought, this, this is an area of transition. This is an area that people cross and a few feet you're in another country. And I find it very interesting that he has in one hand the inflated balloons and in the other hand a bag with the deflated balloons. So that same transition is there. Some absurd areas where the fence is completely open. A lot of board, a lot of uh, surveillance, and I'm also looking for markers. There are 300 and. 40 something markers uh, throughout all the border. <coughs> Excuse me. And every time that I run across one of them, I photograph it. And they're he I, well, they're not hidden, but they're in the most uh, uh, strange places. I'm also looking for uh, cultural markers. And on my research, I find out I was interested in the in the landscape um, because of the history of the landscape in this country. The history of, of the landscape in this country um, it might be shared also with the history of landscape in Mexico. When the British came um, to America, they brought also with their troops, an artist. And as soon as the artist will touch land, he will start to sketch and to draw, to paint, print make the landscape. But with a very specific sense, uh, he wouldn't do this to um, capture the beautiful light, the exotic, the terrain. This was a document, a document that um, he can go back to uh, Europe and said, this gentleman that you see here is ours. And not only that, it's also for sale. You can come and occupy this. So uh, having that consideration and also knowing that uh, California, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas once were uh, Mexican territory. I was photographing during the day, during the night, uh, and, and different situations. This is the landscape. Uh, the the prop This is private property, and the rancher decided to put some facilities there. Uh, he decided to put water and uh, porta potty. Um, I also like the, the dichotomy that um, that I find. This is a very sophisticated technology to track migrants with a blimp, but immigration uh, border patrol also uses very rudimentary uh, artifacts to track migrants, and you can find thousands and thousands of these uh, artifacts throughout uh, the whole border. And essentially, the border will hook, will chain uh, this contraption to their truck and drag it right next to uh, the highway to even out and uh, the terrain. So if somebody crosses, they will know exactly where they cross and how many were crossing. I was I I, I was also um, proposing different stuff. Imagine imagining what what this can be. Um, if they are proposing a wall, uh, we might propose a tunnel or a bridge or a table. 
a long elongated table that is miles and miles um, what would we do if we encounter this object as a border would we jump it and keep on going or would we approach it and have a meal and have a conversation with anybody else that is in the other side or a shadow um, that um, people can take refuge from the sun uh, what what will be the conversations that happen there interestingly i did this uh, i took this photo and thought about this in my first trip in my last trip i actually found one <coughs> the only difference is these are put in in place for the border patrol to take shade and you can see the border patrol right in the corner there and i can I cannot help myself uh, to approach people and talk to people and take portraits of them this is right at the end of the bridge uh, between juarez and el paso i'm also very interested in the in the aesthetics of the border. This gentleman lives a few feet from the border and this is what he sees every day. The border, the river, border patrol. And it's very different if you see this same scenario from El Paso, you barely see that there's a border there. Uh, cultural aspects um, and uh, these next couple photos, one side is Mexico and one side is the US. This border thing is an invention of man. Topography, nature doesn't allow for a border. Right? And I usually tell my students, can you guess which one is which? And they have a very hard time. And they start to see shadows and the sun. Where does it come from? Uh, on your left, there's the US. On your right is Mexico. And again, I'm interested in north and south. What's up is down. What's down is up. And every obstacle that they might put to prevent either people or cars. This is a couple, this is a husband and wife that I, that I encounter in the middle of nowhere uh, photographing and uh, they were talking to each other. I approached them. He lives in the Mexican side, she lives in the US side and uh, every day they go on and meet. They both have dual citizenship. They both uh, share English and Spanish. But in order for them to meet without this barrier, they have to go half hour to the crossing point and half hour back. And they told me that that barrier wasn't there uh, a couple of years ago. So this is completely new. Uh, this one, <coughs> this is in Arizona. And I encounter these strange contraptions uh, in the middle of the desert. And I like to think about uh, the a collaboration between the border patrol and me and me capturing these sculptures that they're putting out there in the middle of nowhere that they don't have any any sense one of the most important things is uh, uh, it was actually very shocking to find this i didn't know about the existence of these cages uh, if you look up closely it doesn't have a roof this is the desert in the summer is 110 degrees uh, at night it might uh, go down all the way to 40 so if you stay there for a couple hours if they held they if they um, capture you um, you're either gonna freeze or die and I'm thinking about the people who put all their creativity in manufacturing these artifacts And again, those sculptures that they're putting out there, more tires.
This is one of the last ones that I have taken, and it's the delta where the river uh, goes into the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And people actually cross one way and the other. There no, there's no law enforcement, and the person that is in the other side, all of a sudden you, you meet him there, and they're all worried about um, fishing. They're not worried about citizenship. They're not worried about anything else but fishing. The fishing is very good because the river is dragging shrimp and nutrients and uh, to the ocean. <coughs> and in the ocean, there's an enormous amount of fish waiting for that. So it's, 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 um, it's, it's very good for that. I have encountered also uh, these very interesting uh, characters. If you see uh, his belt, he he has collected a number of gun shells to uh, make some noise. And I'm gonna um, because um, to link this with the with the comics and uh, and uh, graphic novels. I'm gonna share two pictures of uh, uh, a project that I've been having a lot of fun constructing this. Let me introduce you to Mexicalians. Mexicalians are a uh, very particular breed. They are closely related to the German aliens and the Norwegian aliens and the Colombian aliens and the Guatemalan aliens. And uh, they live amongst us. And uh, they have these special and interesting powers to connect with outer space. And you might not know who these people are, uh, but they live amongst us. The truth is I've been having a lot of fun building these characters and putting them in a diorama sort of uh, space to live. They, they also are having a lot of fun when, when they are working with me. I'm going to leave it like that because of time. Thank you. Actually, I guess I have some half-formed thoughts about uh, wing. I was really, I really liked your chalkboard project. I think it's really interesting, and and you made a comment that was sort of implied that there was a moment where the image wasn't saying everything that was sort of inside of the of the the people that you were photographing, and so that there was. There was something that needed that text needed to be a part of of the images, and I thought that that was really pretty fascinating. And um, Javier, when you were showing your photos, especially where you started with this discussion of this is where I saw a really interesting connection. You were saying I was I really wanted to photograph landscapes, um, but the first two uh, photographs that you showed were people like people tattoos, so the sort of writing on their body. So there was this really interesting connection where text and image came together. So I was just maybe hoping you could both talk a little more about that. Um, well, when I started, uh, I, uh, uh, I was looking at, uh, I was influenced by uh, Gary Winogrand or street photographers, and I wanted the photograph to be the point. So the photograph is sort of this uh, aesthetic object. That was the point for me in the beginning. My 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 idea of what I thought was a was an interesting photograph. And then after a while, I started to think that uh, I mean, how I got the photograph was not that important to me. But then I started to think that the process of how I got the photograph was maybe as important, if not more important, than the photograph, because I talked to literally thousands of strangers, and I'm always uh, confronted by my assumptions. Uh, when I get outside my own personal uh, technological and uh, cultural bubble and I enter someone else's. And so um, 
that's when I started to think the chalk more. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the people were telling these little sort of snippets of their lives. And then uh, I started to write more about uh, people's stories. So now I can see that uh, in some ways the photograph was a way to get to the story when before it was photographed. Um, so, I, 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 I wanted to um, take to take landscapes because I've always been either frightened or I dismiss the landscape in my photo. You know, when I looked at the photos of Ansel Adams, I, I would think that's not what I want to do. Uh, I want to do something more personal. And uh, I've been always drawn to, to people. I'm an introvert, and the camera has been an excellent tool to approach people and approach people in circumstances that are odd. Uh, if I come without a camera and I start talking to somebody, they're going to think that it is, it's going to be super awkward. <laughs> it, it, it really, um, probably you share the same the right. same thoughts. I mean, I go do to, this without a camera. On my right. <laughs> go to somebody in the, in the bus station and I start asking him or her that, what is it about your life that is interesting? I'm not gonna tell you. What <laughs> kind of crazy, right? But if I approach them with a the camera, then there's an instant connection. Like, huh? This is what you're doing, and all of a sudden there's a call and response. And uh, interestingly, people open up and tell me very intimate things about their life. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to challenge myself and, um, and, and photograph the landscape, uh, photograph it in a different way. And I, I was always pulled back to, to work with, with people. And more than text, working with text is working with symbols. Mm -hmm. I, I find it very, very difficult to work with text. I, I, I mean, as as, uh, uh, yeah, as Wing has done it, you know, beautifully. I'm 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 still too afraid to in introduce any type of text. Mm -hmm. It might have letters, but it's more a symbol than than a text. Well, I just want to thank both of you. I also think both of your projects together. I'm very grateful that I was able to experience the two of you speaking um, in the same format because I think there's so much that happens um, between the two of you. So I'd like to um, also just want to say that I just found the work and both of your work so stunning. And I want to um, start actually with the image um, that first photograph you showed of your mother watching television, mm -hmm. which has just visually, there's so much because of the upholstery of the chair. <laughs> and then of course the image, and of course the year I found myself of, co of course mentally computing that I think we're roughly the same age based on the television set. Um, <laughs> but that statement that you made, um, you know, that you were so focused on the box. So I was thinking a lot about framing and how you framed both not only these pictures, but also in a sense your own story and that's the link that I want to make between your two projects and the, and the way you presented but I was very struck by that when the moment that you said um, that you were so focused on the box in other words the television that your own um, family and other Asian people the few that you encountered but that your mother became exotic to you you said so I thought that was extremely interesting and compelling and seemed to me in a sense a kind of jumping off point for much of the work that you've gone on to do so, I just found that so generative. Also, the chalkboards and the question that it seemed to me, and certainly my, my friends who are photographers as well, and that experience of being behind the camera and what it is to shape. And also, of course, you made a reference to the self referentiality that, in another level, of course, while photographing these other people, you're also photographing yourself. And um, I was also very struck by your project with uh, the borderland, and again that parallel your trip back to China eight years ago. You said it was my first time. Your first time. I went made four trips in the last. 
Okay, but for the first time eight years ago, and then your trip to this to this border region and moving, and I just found I, I just want to say because I think very often this question of that link between um, our lives as artists and the work that's done, and then the story that creates that the work or that is the impetus for the work somehow gets lost. So I would like to somehow foreground the actual work, <laughs> the art that you have made, and not just. You know, the various stories of migration that have have led to that. Um, so I think that's that's really I think where I wanted to go with that. But I wanted to thank you both of you for presenting a way of telling the narrative and both breaking the narrative and also creating a political and historical context for understanding this, both with the broader story of your father's origins, complex origins of your own story. So thank you both. So maybe we should. Okay, let's open it up for the public. Uh, I, I love the, the, the ideas. And we were talking about uh, in the first uh, series of talks about the power of the idea. And I find in all of the, whether it's the comic art or whether it's the photographic art, what, what makes the, the artwork that you're producing going is the strength of the idea behind it and, and the absurdity of an incomplete fence sitting in the middle of the desert. Right. Uh, uh, and I was, I was very interested in your different styles and the choices that you were making in the <coughs> In the, the children's books, there's a deliberate choice for the style that you were selecting from one top to the next. Uh, Mahan, uh, you initially commented that you weren't sure that the style of the comic was a sort of camp I guess, they thought it was kind of uh, strange. And I think for, for, for uh, photography, I mean, you mentioned Ansel Adams, there's a particular style. Uh, where do you where do you evolve style? I mean, with the photography, do you find sometimes that you can't you, because of the camera and its image? What what do you what, what what more can you do with your art and the camera? Or are, are you always stuck with the fact that it's an image? Uh, there's a debate uh, with digital manipulation of an image that you can do all kinds of crazy things with the image and good mm -hmm. and I was just interested to hear how well you thought about photography and have you can you or are you interested in evolving what you do with the image? Uh, well is it just the idea that that, uh, that provides the strength to what you do? Um, so st style first style is is something that <clears throat> I don't. I do not take into consideration. Um, but people recognize how I photograph, so that might be might be it. Um, the, the 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 second part of your question is super interesting because when I arrived to do my masters here, they wanted to push me. To do something different, and uh, an older student, um, I know what I want, and they were asking me, "Why don't you photograph with a cell phone? Why would I do that? <laughs> Why are you photographing people? Nobody's doing that anymore. Nobody's photographing portraits. Why are you doing that? That's passe. That's because I think." photographing people right now is of the most importance now that we have become so detached from humanity and from each other it's of the most importance that you come to a portrait and can face it in a in a very close way uh, I do very little manipulation I correct the color the manipulation that I do is when I'm constructing and people putting people in situations. <coughs> but for the most part, I correct color and uh, 
and 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 I just I rarely crop. I I try to keep it as as simple as possible, and that's that's not my thing. And I'm not sure if I'm evolving or devolving because I kept right the same the same track. I'm I'm not opposed at all to people doing highly manipulated images, but. Um, uh, yeah, I try to, and it's weird because it's, it's not, it's not real, it's not real either. A photo of the a landscape as vast as it might be is a very limited view. Um, editing the rest of the world out, and by that I mean the rest of the world and the sounds and the uh, and the smells and the heat and the conversations that I have. So I'm giving a very small. Uh, part of the whole, whole photographic experience. Um, <clears throat> well, I think maybe uh, style, in a sense, is a strong point of view. You have a strong point of view. <laughs> I feel I have a strong point of view. And I think that, um, so in that sense, style becomes content. And I can see that, you know, I mean, I know what you're saying, sometimes people feel uh, in the art world, Documentary is not art, you know, it's, it's journalism, right? So I've heard, you know, we've gone through the same thing. So I think that um, when I started, uh, I, I tried to imitate Gary Whitaker. You know, I think it takes a while for you to shed influences so you can find your own voice, I guess. And I guess, uh, uh, I'm, but I'm always trying different things. So, you know, with the chalk hole, with wearing out paper folds, I see that you're working you're, with, the, with the landscapes, mm -hmm. the evidence of human landscapes, and then the new series, I've never seen one. That's great. <laughs> uh, so, I, you know, always trying new things. Mm -hmm. So, I think uh, hopefully um, you can do things uh, that seem to come from somewhere within uh, rather than trying to copy an aesthetic or something. But you mentioned one stylistic choice in your speech. Um, you um, did your lake project, lake speed project, only in black and white. Why? Well, because and why did you come back to color? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I taught myself to look at photography books, and so I look at the. The iconic ones, and you know, they're all black and white. So I thought black and white was more artful. And I could see every bias for its color. And then after a while, then you know, you always try something new. So then, uh, when I started doing color, I go back and forth. Sometimes I feel you now that I'm done with color. I'm not as good as I used to be in black and white because you're used to thinking in terms of shades of gray. And when I was photographing black and white, it's, you asked me what color sh shirt was I was going to tell you. I just was thinking. Things are great. So I can see you evolve, but you also do something. <laughs> Just a moment. I used to be one of the gas station of Tali Eagles at Super America. Um, I was the professional Boston turnaround guy for Super America, so they give me the post stores. And uh, here comes a guy. Who basically comes with pliers and says, Can I put my pliers in your store? And I say, Who are you? He says, I'm with you. I have the gallery next door to you. I say, Cool, he's a business guy. I don't have anything to happen. He looks, he goes, he goes online, checks me out, comes back and says, You're doing amazing things. I say, What do you mean? He said, I checked you out. He said, I never talked to, to the public. I say, What do you mean, talk to the public? I just put stuff on social media. That's all I'm, all I'm doing for now. And when you say, Come to my gallery, that whole event. The first ever event for Avril Bahadur was done in this country. It's a small part of it. <laughs> the, first, the first two people who came joined my board. <laughs> so, thank you. Wiki. We've had maybe you seven events at the gallery, and uh, yours was most memorable. <laughs> and uh, it was, and plus, just the way it happened. And uh, no, I, I, it's, it's, you can see what you're doing now. It's a privilege, privilege to know you. <clears throat>
Ich habe hier, um, so, this is called graphic uh, visual narratives. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in the way you, you already um, were saying a little bit about that, of telling stories. So in the beginning, you showed pictures where you created stories by combining symbols or challenging symbols. And at some point, you went to the landscape. And, uh, so there were many uh, images that really needed explanations. Mm -hmm. heard that those explanations from you, but without them, maybe they would be beautiful but um, meaningless. So, if you do an exhibition, do you uh, add a comment, or how do how do you combine the the, the narrative with the image? <coughs> uh, I learned very early uh, in my career that. Um, over explaining things will get in the way of uh, the, the image appreciation. One of the first, um, one of the first uh, exhibits that I have here, it was actually in Lake Street, uh, a gallery called Gus Lucky's, that is way, way, way gone. And uh, I made a triptych, and I was so proud of it. Big photos, one, two, three, and I know exactly what they meant and exactly right how did they refer to each other and talk to each other. And uh, it was a group show, and uh, the day of the opening, I'm standing right to my staff, and a lady will come to my, in front of my pictures and will, you know, scratch her head, will go around and come back and do the same thing. And finally, at the end of the, the, the opening, she, she came, like, you have to tell me, what are these about? And I'm like, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> this is about this, and they're related in this way. And I have my whole spiel, five minutes, right? Telling her, what are these about? When I finished, she uh, made a gesture and a sound. She went like, oh. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Right, what, what happened, right? So I ask her, let me ask you something. What did you saw here? And she said, well, they, they, your images related a lot to me and my mother. And she came up with this extraordinary story that overpassed my, my, my intent. And I was shocked and I said, you know what? Let's do something. Let's pretend that you didn't hear me. Forget <laughs> everything that I just told you. And keep that story. Because that story, your interpretation is way more valuable than whatever I can tell you. Because it relates personally to you. So from there on, I thought, I'm going to put some information. And if people are interested in, in, in the images, they will approach them with all the background from wherever, whenever they were born until the second that they approach the image, they have all this baggage of information and they are gonna pour it there and the image is gonna respond in a certain way. And that's more beautiful than me saying, these are about these specific things. And <coughs> it's very interesting because I show the two eagles and all of a sudden people are offended. They're like, they're dead and you're altering and uh, you know you're crushing these very sacred symbols of of americanism right um or people are like yes this is how we feel right now this is who we are right now we might not like who we are right now but this is who we are maybe later, hopefully later, we're going to become something completely different. But right now, this is who we are. And to acknowledge that through an image, I think is, is, is quite beautiful. So I rely a lot on interpretation of people to coming to the image and having that conversation with, with the material that I'm, that I'm putting there. Okay, maybe this is a Beautiful way to end. I'm afraid we have to leave the room now because there's another room. Uh,